couple of weeks since I've had the opportunity. I've missed you. You probably haven't missed me, but I'm excited to be here with you this morning. As we wrap up, this is our final Sunday in This Is Me series. Uh, so let me let me explain to you where we're headed after this week. Um, I don't know about you, but it feels like, it just feels like to me May has been pretty heavy, right? With all the storms, the flooding, just a lot of stuff going on in people's life. It's almost like we've went, uh, like we've been wrestling a gorilla, right? Ten rounds in the ring with a heavyweight. And so we decided we would push everything back, what we had intended for this summer. And what we want to do is we want to talk for a couple of weeks on one single word. And that word is hope. And so we want to spend the next couple of weeks, next week is Father's Day. Uh, We want to talk about the hope that you have as a father and how you can bring that into your family. But we just want to spend some time as followers of Christ rejoicing in the hope that we have. And maybe through this little brief little window that we have, maybe we can walk out of here encouraged and uplifted and refreshed because we have a tremendous hope in God. And so we want to do that for a couple of weeks, and then we're going to get into what we wanted to do in the summer. And what we want to do this summer is we actually wanted to tackle a book of the Bible. And we decided that we were going to try to be faithful and march through the book of Romans. Uh, It's 16 chapters, but this is going to be like a four-year, three-year span that we do this, all right? And so uh, what we want to do is like the first 10 weeks, all right, we're just going to cover the first three chapters. And then we're going to take a break with the the holidays, and then we'll come back at the first of the year. So if you're a slow reader, all right, the first three chapters in 10 weeks, that's right up your alley, all right? So we want to encourage you, if you want to get ahead and start studying and reading uh, the book of Romans, we're going to be in it for a while, and we're going to look, and Romans is, is a great, it's arguably the best book of the Bible. There's a lot of them that are great, but I mean, when you stop and you look at the book of Romans, man, and it talks about the righteousness, and there's a lot of heavy, heavy stuff that we're not going to skip, we're not going to bypass, we're going to tackle it, and we're going to put our faith and hope in the Holy Spirit and let God lead us through that and challenge us as we study the book of Romans. But here we are today, we're going to wrap up, this is me, I have loved, I have loved every opportunity to study this series, all right, I have, I have been humbled about my weaknesses. I am so good and have uh, probably way too much pride that I don't show my weaknesses, that I don't hand my weaknesses to my God. And so this has been refreshing these last five weeks to be able to explore this and to see the limitless potential that God has when we turn over our weaknesses. And so this morning we want to wrap this up. John Haywood, who was an English playwright for hundreds and hundreds of years, put a remarkable twist to a quote. And this is to a famous saying. And this is the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. Have you heard that saying before? And here's the twist that John Hay would put in it. Rome wasn't built in a day, but they were laying bricks every hour. According to Haywood, Rome is just the result, and the bricks are the system. The system, or you could say, this moment This hour, this day, is greater than the goal. That somebody was always moving forward, taking advantage of the moment, laying a brick, and that is how Rome was built. This morning, I want to ask you a simple question. If if someone were to ask you, what was the greatest moment of your life, what would you say? What is the first thing that would come to your mind? What is the greatest moment of your life? I know I don't know all of you, but it's probably a safe bet to think that you have had some crazy, maybe even extraordinary events that have happened in your life. What was it? There was that moment when you were born, that's pretty significant, right? When the clock of your life started ticking, and you sucked in your first lungful of air, and the whole adventure started. Probably you don't remember that, though, unless you had a crazy dad that brought in a camcorder during the birth, right? Maybe, perhaps, it was the first step that you took. 
and the world became a different place, especially for your mom. Maybe it was your first words. Do you remember what your first words were? You started talking, and you've never shut up since then, right? I have a, I have a daughter that's like that. I have to tell her, slow down, breathe. Maybe it was your first job. Maybe a first friend. First date. First kiss, right? You probably remember that. I won't mention names. I'm not the kind of guy to kiss and tell. The moment you fell in love. That moment your child was born. And nothing was ever the same. Maybe it was the moment that God became real to you. I love this quote by John Orkberg. Listen to what he says. He says this, The greatest moment of your life is right now. Not because it's pleasant, not because it's happy, not because it's easy, but because this moment is the only moment you've got. Every past moment is gone. It's never coming back. And if you live there, you lose your life. I love that quote. And the Bible backs this up in Psalms 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice in it and be glad in it. Lamentations 3 tells us that steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And Paul warns us in Ephesians 5, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. This moment. Why is this moment right now the greatest moment in your life? It's the only place that you can meet God. It's exactly the place where you can meet God because we serve a God who does not live in yesterday, and he doesn't live in tomorrow. He lives right now. I am, I am. You know, a couple of years ago, BuzzFeed put out an article that was titled 24 Things That Could Change Your Life in 24 Hours. And I thought to myself, that's an interesting article. I need to read that. Maybe it'll change my life. It did not change my life. As a matter of fact, I looked at it and I thought, is this what our society has become? That these things are life-changing. Now, you'll have to go look it up. I'm not going to spend time reading all it. Number one on the list, listen to this. This is life-changing stuff that BuzzFeed put out. All right, And I'm not encouraging you to go look at BuzzFeed. It must not be worth the time. But listen to the number one thing that they said. The, the, the best thing, the thing that could change your life is you could walk around the entire island of Manhattan. Locals call it the 32-mile course called the island, and it's a major rite of passage. And you might be sitting there going, what? I mean, I have no desire to walk 32 miles, all right? You might be looking at it thinking, why is that life-changing? They say, because you get to see some interesting sides of the city that most people never experience, all sides, actually. Okay, bravo. I'm sure you would see some interesting stuff. Then it goes on and lists this. It says another thing that you can do that would be life-changing is walk the trail called the Lost Coast in California, 24 miles along the ocean side. One of the challenges that could be life, life-changing, they said, is that you actually have to get a tide map because the tide comes in and out and some of the trail is underwater. Yeah, that's life-changing when you're swept out to sea, right? <laughs> and I read this on, and it went on and on. And there's some, there's some I mean, some things. You know, you could read in 24 hours any one of Shakespeare's 37 plays. Thanks, but no thanks. But, you know, I mean, it could be life-changing. I don't know. It said you could go vegan for a day. No thanks. And then it turns around, or you can go the opposite and smoke the best brisket you ever had in your life. And I said, okay, bring me on, you know, I'm up for that. <laughs> then I went on to say you could learn a new language. No, no, I could not. <laughs> then it talked about a new dance move. You know, if you've seen me dance, it takes a lot longer than 24 hours <laughs> for me to learn a new dance move. But the best one out of all 24 of them was the last one. And it said this, in 24 hours, you could turn off your phone, leave your laptop closed, and spend the whole day goofing off with your best friend. And I said, that could be life-changing. And I thought to myself as I read this stuff, I thought, is this really what life-changing things are all about? 
So I turn to the source that's the most dependable, and it's the Bible. And I turn to my teacher, Jesus, and I asked him. And he said, you want to experience life changing? Guess what you need to do? Serve. Serve somebody besides yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting that Jesus, as an example of life-changing moments, takes time before his crucifixion to watch, to wash the, the feet of his disciples. In Matthew chapter 20, he says the Son of God did not come to be served, but to what? To serve. And to give his life as ransom for many. Here's the big idea today that we want to share with you. That's life-changing, in my opinion. And it is that with God, there is limitless potential in this moment, in this time, today. You do not have an opportunity to serve somebody down the road. You have the opportunity right now in front of you to change somebody's life. And so how do we go about it? How do we go about it? Here's the problem with it. The reason we don't take advantage of today is that there is a word in the English, in the English dictionary that keeps us from taking advantage of that. And you find it in Exodus chapter 8. Let me give you the background of the text. Moses and Aaron is sent to Egypt, per, perhaps the most powerful nation on the earth at that time, to free God's people. They've been in bondage for 400 years. They've been crying out to God. God hears their cries. And so he sends Aaron and Moses to rescue them, to set them free. And so they go on and they take on Pharaoh. And God says, you know what? I have a few things up my sleeve. And it's called the ten plagues. And so by the time we get into Exodus chapter 8, one plague has already happened. The river into blood. And so now we're looking at it, verse 1, And then, Mo, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, so that they may serve me. But if you, but if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country. You ready for this? You know what it is? Any of you? With frogs. Well, that's not so bad, right? Frogs? I like frogs. But listen to what he says. Verse 3, The Nile shall swarm with frogs that they shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and, and on your bed and into your houses of your servants, your people, and into your ovens and into your kneading boards. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and all of your servants. They're not just there, they're on you. All right, This is totally disruptive. Matter of fact, Old Testament scholars note that the writer is deliberately painting a comic picture to ridicule Pharaoh. Frogs in your house, frogs in your bed. It almost sounds like Dr. Seuss, right? Frogs in your bed. This is getting seriously disruptive. Frogs are everywhere. How many of you remember a couple of years ago when we had the plague of the crickets here at the church? Do you remember that? Yeah, that was, that was actually disgusting. I still find crickets like skeleton remains in corners of our church. All right, and places that we didn't move stuff, and there they all. I remember being in my office, and they just coming out from under my desk. I was like, what is going on? If you went out to the annex, we got cracks in the sidewalks. They were just swarming out of it. And I thought to myself, when I saw that, I was like, this is what he's talking about. No, it's not. They're everywhere. Everywhere. They are actually on you. They're in your bed. I remember one time when I was a teenager and I was camping and a storm came in and we, we had just taken a tarp and thrown it up over a tree and tied it down and this storm comes in and we're laying there and which we had it open to the wild and so all these spiders came into our tent and I'd be sleeping and all of a sudden I feel a spider running across my face and I'd be like, ah! And I'd fall back asleep and it, and it happened so much and I'm looking at this going, that's what's happening here, right? They're everywhere. Take a bath, there they are, Right? It's disgusting. It's crazy. Verse 7, I love this. But Pharaoh's musicians did the same thing by their secret arts, and they made frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. Nice going, guys. It's not like we don't have enough frogs already. The trick would have been to get rid of them, right? That's not how God works. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let your people go to sacrifice the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, listen to this, you've got to clue into this. 
Verse 9, verse 10. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and left only in the Nile. And in verse 10, what do you think Pharaoh said? Pharaoh thought about it and he said, Tomorrow. And I look at that and I scream. I'm like, what are you thinking? You could have relief today. I think what Pharaoh's doing is he's like, you know what, well, let's sleep on it. And maybe in the morning when, it, when we wake up, they're gone, right? And then I don't have to rely on Moses. I don't have to rely on God. And so many times when we, we look at this and we have the opportunity, the potential of today in front of us, how many times do we grab it and we look at it and instead we go, tomorrow I will do it. This is a danger that we have. But you can experience the limitless potential of today. So how do you do it? How do you do that? Three things that you have to trust. The first one is this. Extraordinary outcomes begin with ordinary obedience. Let me say that again. Extraordinary outcome begins with ordinary obedience. Today, if you want to, you can take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's where we're going to be at. And if you know your church background, you know that this is centered around David and Goliath. But we're not going to talk about the battle. In order for the battle to take place, in order for David to be where he is, an extraordinary outcome. Because if you know your Bible, you know that David conquers this giant, this warrior. All right? But what happens before that? He's already, it's like pregame warm up. He's already doing the necessary things because an extraordinary outcome depends on ordinary obedience. And he's already being obedient. And watch what happens. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting with verse 17, and Jesse says to David his son, Take to your brothers an ephah. Uh, which is, uh, is basically a measurement of grain, about a bushel, of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. And also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand and see, your brothers are, are, and see if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Pretty simple two verses, right? But what I, see, what I want you to see here this morning is ordinary obedience from David. Now, I don't know, maybe David was bored, and maybe a little road trip would be great. But I, I can tell you this, as a, as a father of, of children that are older than two teenagers right now, my oldest one's married, so I don't have to worry about that to a degree. But I know that when I tell them to do something, it's like, Ugh. right? We, ha we have an upstairs to our house, and we, I hate climbing those stairs. It's like Mount Everest to me, all right? And so what we'll do is we'll take stuff of our daughters and we'll lay them on the stair and we'll say, hey, Kylie, hey, Libby, Kaylee, when she lived there, hey, take this to your room. All right, I'll do it someday, right? I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow lasts three weeks, right? Have you ever done that with your, with your kids? Ever, ever complained about taking out something, the trash, something so ordinary, so simple? Ordinary obedience leads to extraordinary outcomes. I look at this, and I, I look at this, and David could have said, you want me to take cheese and crackers to my brothers? Come on. He's the youngest out of all of them. They're in battle. I'm sure he wanted to be with them. I'm sure he wanted to be on the battlefield. And now he's, instead, he's, he's sitting there watching the flock, and he has a simple errand to run. Not some great message. Something so simple. But he does it without complaining, without delaying, without griping. Ordinary obedience leads to extraordinary outcomes. What is obedience, though? Growing up as a kid, we had outside dogs. And to me, a great dog is an obedient dog, right? That's what I think. All right? In order to have a great dog, it has to be obedient. Now, Carrie had a dog in the house when she was growing up. And so when we got married, we decided, we decided that when our oldest turned four years old, we were going to get her an inside dog, right? 
All right, and so when you go from an outside dog to an inside dog, there has to be a, another higher level of obedience. Do you get what I'm saying? Because it's called potty train or housebroken, whatever you want to call it, right? And so we decided we would buy this dog for my daughter. We, we looked around, what could we get? And we settled on, and, and this should have been the first red flag, because the word toy was in the breed of the dog. Toy fox terrier, right? It's about the size of this water bottle, Right? And it was cute. We, we wrapped it up in a box. We gave it to her on her fourth birthday. She loved it. It was during the Toy Story craze, and she named it Bullseye after the horse, right? And she would put a harness on it and carry it around like a purse, right? But that dog, that dog, we tried everything, but it could not get down being housebroken. And I don't know about you, but I just didn't care for a dog to run around peeing and pooping in my house, Right? And it drove me nuts. I mean, we, we looked on the internet. We talked to people. We tried everything to get this dog housebroken. And after months and months of this happening, there was this instance that it, this bullseye went to the door. And I was like, ah! And I got up to let him out. And before I got there, he peed all over the carpet. And I was like, and I picked him up. I picked him up. <laughs> and I was like shaking, you know? And, and I heard my wife go, Lance, careful! Right? And I'm like, Ugh. I go outside and I just wanted to break it like a pretzel. You know, I was like, oh, I was at my max. And I go outside and I'm looking at his dog and he's not being obedient. And we tried everything. And I, and I can't take a piece of paper like a newspaper, roll it up and hit it like a normal dog because it's a toy dog. <laughs> and out of my frustration, I just took my hand and I, and I flicked it like that. And I flicked, I flicked it on, the, on its head and all of a sudden it just went, Pfft. Its eyes roll back in its head, and I'm like, <gasps> and I, I take it over the ground, I lay it on the ground, I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's just laying there. I go inside, I walk in, and I look at Karen, and I go, hey, we have a situation outside. <laughs> she comes out on the back patio, and she looks at the dog, and she's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, I just flicked it. She goes, Lance. I'm like, I, I kid you not, Carrie, I just flipped it like that. And all of a sudden, it finally started to wake up, and it was a little drowsy. Caitlin comes out, and it's staggering. And he's like, what's wrong with my dog? I don't know. <laughs> that dog never got it down. I would love to say that I flicked some sense into it, but it didn't. We wind up finally getting rid of it to a couple in Sky Took. They emailed us a couple of months later and said it was the best dog ever. I was like, Whatever. A good dog is an obedient dog. A good dog is a dog that does what you want it to do. And some of you might be like, no, 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 no. A good dog is a lovable dog. That's because you want it to be a lovable. Let's call that obedience. A good dog is an obedient dog. It's not dissimilar to a child or to children. What makes a kid a good kid? The teacher says, I have a good kid in my class. What does she mean? She means I have an obedient kid in my class. This kid does everything that we ask or expect him or her to do. It's not dissimilar to employees, right? I have a really good employee. What do you mean? What are you really saying? I have an obedient employee. You might be like, no, 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 no. It could mean that they take initiative. That's because you want them to take initiative. Let's call that obedience. Are you tracking with me? What about this crazy question? What makes a Christian a good Christian? What makes a follower of Christ a good follower of Christ? I'm tripping over the same word, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to get at. Simple, ordinary obedience leads to extraordinary outcomes. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commands. Are you tracking Here's the second thing. If you want to experience limit, limitless potential in today, trust that faith, and if you've got your outline, you look at it, faith, not your fill in the blank, okay? Faith, not whatever you have to put in that blank will determine how God uses you. And what I mean by that is that when you look at that blank, that your blank, your faith, will determine how God uses you, not whatever you put ahead of God could be your strength, could be your wealth, it could be your friends. Listen to what happens here in verse 32. 
All right, David goes to the front line. He sees the battle lines are drawn. The Palestinians are here. The Israelites are here. Goliath comes out for 40 days. He comes out, and this man was a giant of a man. He was made for war. Nobody could defeat him. Nine feet plus. He had all the skills. Everybody was quaking. And he goes out, and he draws a line in his sand, and he challenges anybody from Israel to come fight him, and the winner takes all. And no one wanted to. And then he insults the army of Israel, and listen to what David sees. He sees all this play out in front of him, and David said to Saul, let no man, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep the sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb away from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and who has delivered me from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and let the Lord be with you. A couple of things here that you need to notice. Faith, maybe you need help filling in this blank. Faith, not your age, will determine how God uses you, right? Faith, not your age. God uses a boy to kill a warrior. God can use you. You might be sitting here today at 15, 16 years old and think, you know what, there's nothing that I can do for the kingdom of God. That is the furthest from the truth. Or perhaps you're sitting here today at 85, and go, you know what, I've done my time. I've done all I could and there's nothing else to do. That's nonsense. God still has a plan. God still uses you. I love going to Mission of Arlington because of the woman that started it, Tilly, who at 87 years old is still on the battlefield, still knocking down giants. Faith, not your occupation, will determine how God uses you. You might be sitting here this morning going, you know what, I'm just, I'm just a welder. I'm just a warehouse guy. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a cook. I'm just a truck driver. God still can use you because of your faith. God takes a shepherd boy to beat a warrior because that is what God does. Your faith determines how God uses you, not your occupation. Here's the last one. Faith, not your ability, will determine how God uses you. What did David know? David must have been pretty talented with a slingshot, right? Right? I mean, he killed a lion and bear. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I've never killed a lion and bear, especially with a slingshot or a sword or a bow or whatever. All right? I'd, I'd use a big gun from a long, long distance. Right? But he knew without a doubt that going into battle, who was going to kill Goliath? Him? No. He knew God was. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Your ability to make a difference is not determined by your age, your occupation, or your ability. In other words, the lid of your success to make a difference is not determined by your age or occupation or your ability. It is determined by your faith in God. Amen? Look at all the potential here today in the hands of a mighty God. So what is faith? Faith is believing that with God there is limitless potential right now. Right now, today. Without God, we are truly limited in what we could do. There is so much potential in this building right now. If you want to see God do something amazing tomorrow, go out and love somebody today. Today, and here's the final point, today is preparing you for tomorrow. No better opportunity than right now to make a difference. Today is preparing you for tomorrow. How many will you miss? I like to... I like to try to justify moments that I've missed with God. I 
I like to try to justify it that I was young, immature. And then I read the Bible and I see that God uses a boy to kill a giant. I had just graduated high school. It was the summer before my first year of college. And I was driving into Erie, Kansas. It was a Saturday evening. And I was going in and I stopped at the only gas station in Erie at the time called Pete's One Stop to fill up. I had a date. I was taking a young lady to the movies and it wasn't the girl I said to walk home. And I went inside. I got my gas. I went inside and I paid. And it was one of those gas stations where they have the booths in the back. You can buy your stuff there. They had a kind of a small kitchen and you could sit in the back and you could eat it and a lot of people from our high school would hang out there. And I walked in to pay and I noticed that one of my friends, Raymond, was sitting in the back booth. And Raymond and I had grown up together. Matter of fact, we were first cousins. He grew up just down the road from my house. My mom and his brother. And I knew Raymond. Not only as a friend, but as a family member. When he was young, he would go to VBS and sometimes, occasionally, church camp. But as we got into our teenage years, my path went a different way than his and he hung out with a different crowd than I hung out with. And when you know somebody that well, you know when something's bugging them. And he was distraught. But I had a date, right? I had a movie time to catch. And I thought to myself as I paid and I saw Raymond, and I don't think he noticed me. I said, you know what? I will catch him later on. I will see him tomorrow. Because tomorrow was Sunday, and every Sunday we would gather at my mo- uh, grandma's house, and she would cook lunch. And so I justified, and I said, you know what, tomorrow, not this moment, not today, but tomorrow I will talk to Raymond and find out what's going on. He didn't show up. He didn't show up for the next three weeks, and then him and a bunch of guys went on a canoe trip in Arkansas where they lost control of their vehicle, and he was ejected and killed. And I miss that moment that God had ordained that could have made an impact on Raymond's life. We are not meant to embrace moments. We are meant to embrace God. Because some moments are not always good. God is never anything else but good. Moments are simply the place where we have an opportunity to meet God and to make a difference in someone's life. Every moment, starting today, starting right now. Or perhaps, maybe you would like another night with the frogs. The band, our worship team, is going to come up and play another song, an invitation song. And I don't know where you're at and I don't know some of the circumstances that you're dealing with. But I can think of no better place than to start right now. Today. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with the one person that can change everything in your life. His name is Jesus. And I would love, and our elders will be down here, they would love to introduce you to that name, to that person, to that Savior. Or perhaps maybe you have lived your life in in tomorrow moments and you've missed some moments that God has ordained for you to make a difference in somebody's life and you're carrying that burden and you want to to, to draw a line and say, you know what, I'm done with that. And maybe you just need prayer of encouragement. Our elders will be down here and they would love the opportunity to pray with you this morning. Today. The potential of today is right now. And it's huge. What will you do as we stand and we see?